Ahoy, fellow fern fondlers! And welcome aboard the Joy of Trek, a far out podcast exploring the size play fantasies and biggie smalls of Star Trek. All, All of, of it. it. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. And out in the underbrush is your chief engineer, Greg. Together, we are on a mission throughout the garden department of Loewy's. Oh, nice! Of Star uh, Trek? To find, of Star Trek, to find the stinger in every spore pod and the excellence in every episode. Even the unstable gene sequences? Because every episode must be someone's favorite, and it might as well be us. So germinate in your seeds and join us as we blossom into... The, the Joy, Joy of, of Trek! Trek. <laughs> okay. Getting a little better at the, you know, as you can tell it's still early days. Yes. Right? Those scripts, they're, they're tough to write. Yes. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, you think that's of... like, but yes, like on a mission through the placeholder marker. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, anyway, so let's see if the readers at home, have you guessed which episode we're doing today? Write that down in your copy box. <laughs> Just look around you. <laughs> Just look around you, because we're doing, oh, an episode of the animated series. Season 1, episode 7, The Infinite Vulcan. First aired October 20th, 1973, written by Walter Koenig. Eh? Yes. Who I had to be reminded was the actor who played Chekhov. I was like, that sounds like a familiar name. Was he a writer? Like, what, what, what do I know him of? And it's like, oh, wait, yes. Yeah, and directed by Hal Sutherland. So this is an interesting one mm -hmm. for a few reasons. Like, I kind of wanted to include the animated series. Yeah. Uh, so partly for practical reasons, because, like, sometimes we do this on the weekly. Sometimes we go traveling, and then it's handy to be able to do a shorter episode so we can still keep up with our weekly fix. And the animated series is great for that. Yeah. And the other thing is the animated series seems to be just weird like i've never oh yes that's one way to put it i've never seen any of it no. so it's it's i'm really excited I've seen by it. just screenshots and like you know surprised spock memes and <laughs> <laughs> and this one in particular like the seed for this very podcast that we're doing right now germinated so how, how appropriate thank you there's going to be a lot of that very repetitive because there aren't that many metaphors that I can command. Yes. It started germinating when I was in a, a chat group with some fellow Star Trek appreciators where I'm one of the more experienced Star Trek fans in that group in that okay. I've seen essentially every episode of everything ever since, you know, 1987 yeah, right. several times. And then someone just casually dropped Spock 2 in the middle of a conversation. Like, talking about, oh, Belana Torres in this screenshot is wearing a jacket just like the guy who made Spock 2. I'm like, Spock 2? It's like, is this one of the Shadow episodes? Right. Shadow Realm? What is it? Are we a Yu Gi Oh podcast now? Mirror. Opposite Mirror, Mirror, mirror Universe. That's yeah, but is it? And, and, and so I was thinking something similar. And so I asked them about it, and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the giant Spock, the giant 50 foot Spock. I'm like, what? I've never heard of this. I've got to see this show. <laughs> and so that's why we got to watch it together. And it's even weirder than I thought. Yeah. I mean, it's usually the women who are 50 feet tall. Oh yeah, Attack of the Fifty Wood Woman. That's a you know, uh, that's a size play fantasy. Yes, absolutely. So that's I, I don't know where they're going. I mean, they, I'm pretty sure they've done this before. People going ginormous. Like, isn't this like a thing in Star Trek? Maybe. I don't think that this specifically has happened before. I must be thinking just like cartoons, like or animated stuff, like you know, heavy metal and stuff, where there's definitely things like that in oh. there. Oh yeah. Well, this is exactly what we're talking about. Because, uh, by the way, for, for for those who don't know exactly this um, this this episode, the Infinite Vulcan is an episode where, on a planet of intelligent plant-like creatures, the clone of a human scientist clones Mister Spock for use in a galactic peace mission. Which is one of the biggest MacGuffins that we've ever seen in Star Trek. You mean the device that they keep talking about? The well, no, the whole motivation or plot of the scientist. Oh, interesting. Okay, let's see what right. what, ha what happens when we get closer to that. But I want to talk about this production first. Because uh, Walter Koenig, you're right, is the actor who normally plays Mr. Chekhov. He was not one of the ones who was invited to return to voice the, uh, oh. the animated series. Because the goal was to, to do Star Trek. So it had been cancelled after season three. Yeah. And then the bean counters had realized with a new, more accurate viewer figure processing algorithm, as they called them at the time, <laughs> that it was actually way more popular, Star Trek, than NBC had known. Like, it was their most popular show right. in their key demographic. And they'd cancelled it. And they've, they were looking into, like, doing a fourth season. But all the sets would have to be rebuilt. All the contracts were renegotiated. And that was way and, too expensive. And in the meantime, they, oh, yes. Because it had all been destroyed. Right, yeah. And so there was an effort to make more Star Trek, to appeal to that audience, but cheaper. And yeah, it shows. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> hey, Filmation, an, an animation company, had a very, very successful formula, being able to like reuse loops of animation. It um, shows. Hey, no, I, <laughs> you say that judgmentally, but it was impressive to be able to do like mm-hmm. weekly animation on the cheap. Like this is something that not even anime was doing at the time. Oh, hold on, I don't want to say that. Greg, was anime doing this kind of animation at the time? Who? Interesting question. That would be yes, because in 1963 to 1966, Astro Boy was incredibly popular and commercially successful in Japan. So 100% anime was already doing this. Thanks yeah. for whatever that answer right. was. Well, I mean, I guess I was already moving into the ejecting the warp core segment of our podcast. Oh, okay, uh, podcast. fine. Eject it's... the warp core. <laughs> I say we eject the warp core. I've got a few. They're surrounded by a material 600 times denser than lead. Okay, so scientific inaccuracy there? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's possible that we're into the uh, stable transuraniums at this point, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that was a concept that wasn't even thought of back in the... Uh, it might have been. You know that how the, the higher the, uh, the atomic number goes after, right. after you go into the transuranics, it turns out to be that the shorter the half-life time is. Okay. R- roughly speaking, yeah, it goes. Cool. It, it gets harder and harder for those things to stick together. Oh, okay, right. But there is speculation that there is an, an island of stability which is going to uh, arrive at some point if you like go into even right. higher, heavier transuranics that you would get into a, uh, a stable region again. Nobody's ever been able to like prove this. Where there are elements that, that do last. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know. I mean, everything I know about the periodic table comes from the 1970s series Sapphire and Steel, which states very clearly that transuranics will not be used on planets where life is abundant. Yeah. Uh. Well, that didn't last very long. <laughs> okay. No. I mean, we failed, on the f- we, we failed on the first attempt. Look, this is... Okay, <laughs> shields up. <laughs> what he just means is it's very dense. And then he says right. it's X number denser than lead, and yes. that's, that's fine. Yeah, of course. There's also, you know, as you just said, like, repeated reuse of animations. It reminded me of a worse version of the how they, in, in Battlestar Galactica, they reused the same five to ten different shots of... Vipers and Cylon uh, ships flying across past mirrored and everything, especially in the scenes with the flying critters. Star Trek's been doing that forever. I think, like, even in the recent episodes of, like, an episode that we saw recently from Picard, reused shots from uh, from Discovery. But there's, like, reusing shots and there's, like, Playing the same same shot five times in a row with you know oh a scr- yeah within a, a, the same screech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I got a little annoyed by the yeah. by the swooper sounds as yes. well but hey all of this is also just... swoopers yep well it's, it's oh, not really wow, a war- there's a list it's, it's not really an ejecting the warp core thing but you, you know, know well, the, ornithologists well, called, and bird like right? creatures okay uh, you know with those like curly tent like you know never mind just like Google Ducks and <laughs> oh wow yeah it's a pretty horny episode really, know, kinda. Right? yeah hmm, there's a lot of interesting subtext to be read in there yep. like i have a few of the jeeps that like sulu is doing some booty tooching at some point when he oh, does that, yes. that, that wonderful throw he's a very scrutable and, man and that saucy wink at the end and it's like uh-huh. and a lot of they appear to be very good friends giving real <laughs> Real deep compliments to one another and really <laughs> lingering emotion. Oh, yes. But hey, I think it's very impressive that they were able to do this kind of weekly animation on a, a very restricted budget, which, as I mentioned, was too restricted to invite uh, Walter Koenig back from the original cast. In fact, originally, Nichelle Nichols, who plays Uhura, and George Takei, who plays Sulu, were mm-hmm. not invited we're back. Were also not. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a much smaller cast. And then Leonard Nimoy stood up for the two people of color who weren't invited back. Yes. Not specifically for Walter, which, yeah, that's a little bit... Mm. But yeah, he threatened to walk if specifically George and Nichelle weren't hired. Yeah. He wouldn't join this animated series because he felt like, yeah, it was a cost-saving measure, but you specifically exclude the Russian immigrant and the two people of color that you had on your crew and all oh. the, like, well, native-born Take- Americans. But Take was oh, he's, uh, included. No, born yeah. in, in, in the States, but of Asian descent. Yes. Walter Koenig is a child of Russian immigrants. Yeah. I don't know that he speaks Russian. I don't know that he doesn't. Chief? From what I can tell, that is a no. He does not speak Russian fluently. Thank you. Since he wasn't given a role, he was offered the opportunity to write an episode and make some money that way. That Uh, seems, well, maybe not reasonable, but at least conciliary. 
yeah, kind of a consolation yeah. prize a bit. He described it as not a very happy experience because he had to work together with Gene Roddenberry, who was a, yeah. a notorious rewriter. Ah. Uh, yeah. And he specifically, like, he, he wanted more things that could be done in animation, but that couldn't be done as easily in live action. So things like size play, flying creatures, mm-hmm. plant aliens, mobile plants or whatever. Like, it costs the same to draw a person as it does to draw a tentacle monster. Yeah. Uh, if you have to draw them new for the episode anyway. But it would be much more expensive on live action. Yeah. Whereas animation gives you the opportunity to go wild. Yeah. Yeah. So those were the things that he kept mandating to Walter. One rewrite after another, after another. Such yeah. an unpleasant experience that he didn't come back to write another episode. Shall we dive into it? All right. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so there's a lot of... They are uh, on the planet of the plant people. Did you hear the opening credits, by the way? The theme music? It's all it's disco. And, oh, a little bit, yes. Right? Reminded me very much of uh, Strange New World sounds like that. Well, it's probably the other way around. I'm getting a reading of some kind of power from that building. Because they've got the bloody lights on, don't they? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Way to investigate this newly discovered planet on the edge of the galaxy. I love how uh, Sulu is is going to, like, sees this little plant critter and goes like, oh, this is like, this is kind of cute. Hey, look, they've got Triffids here. Yes. Let's let's pick it up and see what happens. (laughs) Oh, God. It's such a bad idea because he gets stung Mm -hmm. and he goes, oh. Must have been a thorn. And the thing sort of burrows away. There's a shot of the interior of that building because they've discovered that they're being electronically probed. Yes, they're Ooh. scanned. And for Kirk's like immediately, phaser set to stun. It appears to be an amalgam of devices designed to defend and protect the city. What's the difference between defending and protecting? Um, do we want to get into that? No, probably not. I mean, one of them can mean, like, just shielding and the other, like, actually repelling invasion. Well, I'm thinking, like, more defending it seems like more like a physical thing and protection doesn't, you know, like, yeah, no, you can defend someone against litigation. So that's, it seems like two, yeah. they're very synonymously to the point of it being very hard to be able to defend, what, to define yes. something that is defending but not protecting and the other way around. It's almost like a, is the Hey, Chief, sorry to bother you again. We're, we're really at it this time, but is it a, is the tautology or a pleonasm? Guys, you know we have a computer for exactly this reason. Okay. A tautology uses the same wording or precisely equivalent wording to make a semantically null statement as in big things are large, so no meaningful information is gleaned from a tautology. A pleonasm uses an excess of words to convey an idea. This feels more like a pleonism than anything, because you're saying an amalgamation of things to both defend and protect, that's more, you're doing the excess of words there. So that's that's a pleonism, I guess? Bother the computer, not me. Oh, I always forget which one is which, yes. Well, now that we've heard it Cheers. from the chief, yeah. we will have heard it from the chief, we're just in time to see Sulu lying face down. Yes. Well, not after the doctor picks up a... uh... Jim, I'm picking up a humanoid reading of incredible strength. It's as if he... Ah! Oh, no, something else to do. Oh, they're back outside again. Like, someone realized that they forgot Sulu, and it's like like when you're wandering around, like, a theme park, and you suddenly realize, like, oh, wait, there's only four of us. (laughs) Didn't we start off with five, and then you go back, and two rides back, you you find your uh, group member, like, puking their guts out into a trash can, and in this case, yeah, Sulu's passed out. Uh, An incredibly thrilling medical scene takes place where the, the doctor is kneeling, motionless, next to a motionless Sulu. He's got about one minute to live unless I can find an answer. Yeah. Maybe Dilovin. No good. They're getting a lot out of pan and scan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly there are plant people. Oh, yes. Yeah, suddenly they do arrive. I don't know what they remind me of. They remind me of something, but I can't really put my finger on it. They look like they have radial symmetry, right? Their, their, bit, yes, their bodies. Yes. And they have these green sort of scaly protuberances, what we call their heads. They have these collars with devices on them that they call voters, which assist in translation. And they've got two stalks coming out of their heads, uh, red with a yellow center, which we'd probably call eyes. I mean, it looks like it. they're clearly meant to evoke the eye, eye emotion. Mm-hmm. And they have a much better idea to just sort of drizzle some into Sulu's mouth. Yeah, they're just like, oh, we know this. Like, he's been stung by the, the purple bouncy thingy or the other. Oh, uh, it's called a retlaw. Oh, yeah. Can you guess what that name means? A retlaw? Retlaw. Retlaw. 
It's Walter spelled uh, backwards. Ah, yes. Because <laughs> Walter Keenig said back in the 1940s, which is when he was a kid, there was yeah. a comic book called Planet Comics and the aliens talked backwards. And I was trying to be cute, not clever when I did that. Whenever I get a chance, it's my little signature thing, says uh, Walter Keenig. To turn things around, yes. Yeah, have well, a character's name be someone else's name spelled backwards. Yes. Kirk asks Spock, Are you getting a reading on them? Spock shakes his magic space eight ball and says, results unclear. Uh, we might get another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try again later. We learn that these are the native people of this planet. These are the Philosians, and they're botanical in origin. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, a completely unknown concept. Your medication worked quickly. A minor achievement. Minor. McCoy is properly impressed. Our science doesn't have anything that works that fast. You which is incredible. Which is absolutely pure BS because, like, everything on Star Trek works fast. They like wave the little busy thing in front of them, and like suddenly their skin heals. Like, what do you mean nothing on Star Trek? You inject them with something, and like se seconds later, the results are there. It's like you've <laughs> already is, dumped your warp this core. Goes, this goes against even Star Trek's very loose canon. I let you have one backup warp right, core, like sorry. Voyager, but that's it. Sorry. <laughs> But Kirk, he says, I don't like puzzles, which is bullshit because he yeah. totally loves it. Okay, who's dumping the war court now? <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> and he asks, where's the rest of your people? And Agmar, the leader of these Velosians, shows them. And what we oh, see, yeah. it's this, this cathedralic hall with dead giant plant people. I on. wasn't at first sure if they were dead or not, but yeah, they, apparently they are. They're, they're motionless. They're all gray and sort of hollowed out. I mean, in a way, it kind of does remind me of the, like, the lanes in my area where I grew up as a kid. It's like oh, I, I, I yeah. grew up in a very forestry area, so you, there was usually a paved or a uh, tarmac road in, through yeah. the middle of the forest, and you had like, yeah, a cathedral-like trees growing over it, and it kind of looks a bit like that. And we find out that these plant people were incredibly, like, evolved. Yes, we are a peaceful, uh, pacifistic species now with mildly fascistic, overthrow the entire universe tendencies. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were using 70% of their brains, a very high ratio. Uh, which would plays into the assumption that, like, humans only use, like, 15% of their brain or something, which is, like... Science has, in the meantime, untrue. turned out to be completely nonsense. But Why yes. would you carry around such an expensive organ that you're not using? It consumes 20% yeah. of your calories at all times. Thank you for saying that before I just went on screaming for five minutes. Yeah, get him, Cocky and Kay, get him. Here we have the first of the uh, purple spiral tentacly birdie things. Oh, yes, the swoopers, yes. these dragons with the corkscrew extremities. Yes, let's go <laughs> with that one. Which turns out to be, like, this is sort of a conspiracy, a weird sort of ruse for this technologically advanced species, because their whole thing is that they want Spock for the master. Yeah. I mean, this is an interesting sort of narrative structure, if you want to piece it together, because previously they also talked about... A human came, he brought sickness and death because they talk about that there are gram-positive bacteria that are not native to this planet mm. that apparently, like, devastated the ancestors of the, the Phalosians and which caused is, the death of yeah. all these people. Which is why they're now standing there uh, entombed in this cathedral structure. But yes, the Phalosians, like, like, they kind of drop their, like, peaceful act because, like, these very common swoopers show up and they go like... There is a weapons deactivator in effect here. Your destructive machines will have no effect. It, yeah. And it seems that they, they go off to Spock first, which indeed turns out to be a ruse, because they end up flying away with Spock rather than Kirk. Sorry, my, uh, my bad there. Uh, yes, it was just enough to hold Kirk and Sulu down. Spawning a thousand fanfics. Yeah. yeah. With all the tentacles and the sort of wrapping down. And, yeah. oh, Sulu seems to be, I mean, either not into it or really into it. I don't know what he's into. Yeah. We he might be liking know. it. Uh, and just like in Spock's brain, it turns out that, uh, you know, <laughs> Spock is needed for some, well, in this case, a scientist experiment rather than a uh, society's overlord. If I had a nickel for every time that Spock was kidnapped for a society's nefarious uses... It, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that's happened twice. Okay, so we have Caniclius 5. Or oh, 
Yes. Caniculus, or I however lo- you want to pronounce it. I love how Kirk kind of like almost amiably puts his hand on the uh, shoulders of one of these aliens and like... So help me if you don't tell me where Spock has been taken. Like, I know! Like I'm going to snap your like artichoke head off. It's like, <laughs> that's what they remind me of. They look like artichoke heads. Oh yes, that's, that's right! Huh. And yes, we get the first huge human. It's like yeah. he's like working in like a Roman Greco outfit with a staff which is oddly thin in his hand and it's he's like bare chested yes another plant no definitely human jim and he wants to send them away because i have what i need to impose peace on the universe and yes. his phylosian followers are super excited about it he introduces himself as dr stavos caniculus five and as we say in dutch Kirk chooses eggs for his money (laughs) and says one of only two instances of a phrase that can be considered close to beam me up, Scotty. He says, beam us up, Scotty. History in the making right now. Oh, absolutely. I think this is a where we go to commercial because uh, in good Star Trek tradition, it starts with a captain's log uh, shot coming back from the break. The beautiful Enterprise over the planet Phylos reminding us of what's been happening. We get a shot of the cool animated bridge of the Enterprise. There's a different ops officer. So instead oh. of Chekhov at the ops yeah, station... Yeah, the, the orange stoner who's just kind of like sitting there going, <laughs> like, I'm getting a lot of shaggy vibes from him. <laughs> now, I happen to know that the name is Arex of this officer. I think Lieutenant. I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure. Mm. I think it's he, him. And he has an extra arm or a third arm in the middle of his oh, uh, right. torso. Yeah, 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 I see now. Yeah. It's hard uh, to make out in this shot, but yes. Especially uh, since it's not moving. Yeah, he doesn't get anything to do this episode, so I hope if we do another episode, we'll find out more about Eric's. But everybody's sort of repeating what we've learned so far. There's plant life, they have to adjust their senses. They can't, find, weapons they can't find the human life, so they're, which we later find out is due to the 600 times denser walls. Uh, yep. Kirk orders an orbital bombardment. <laughs> yes. Mr. Sulu, lock ship's phasers on that laboratory building. Use a wide area stun setting. Aye, sir. Apparently ship-mounted phasers have stun settings as well. Yeah. But they can't even come close. Uh, no. A thousand doesn't... kilometers. It's, uh, it's utterly negated. Yeah, so the, the weapon negator seems to work very fine. Phaser stun was neutralized at a distance of 1,000 meters above the area. Which means our weapons are useless. Kirk tasks uh, Uhura with some research. Yes, go find out who the, how, who this Caligula is. And, uh... <laughs> and in the meantime... They are having Scotty make some special equipment. I've got it written down. Bring out the roundup is what I've got written down here. <laughs> you, you, yes, right. <laughs> Now, okay, I think this is brilliant because I think a lot of people figured it out. And, like, children were watching the show as well. It wasn't specifically yeah. aimed at children. It was a kind of confusing blend of uh, uh, adult stories. But, you know, it came in animation and that was for kids, so it was welcoming to children. Right, yeah. And so, like, those often featured a mystery or a secret plot that, you know, is not very hard to figure out, but it's fun to figure those things out. I like how much mystery there was surrounding this gear. Do you have the special equipment? Oh, yeah. Like, and Bones, like, reporting in that one of his great-great-granddaddies. Do you think he had great-great-granddaddies who were married? Oh. Obviously. Imagine if that's the case. Imagine if, like, he had his great-great-granddaddies who were still alive and who still had, like, a farm or a bed and breakfast oh. in Vermont or whatever. Oh, who knows? I mean, like, one... That doesn't mean he has, like, two great-great-great-granddaddies and that they ended up getting married to each other? Well, no, I, I mean, one oh. of them would be his biological or, like, adopt, maybe right. they were adoptive great-great-granddaddies or, you know, maybe it's just, like, a term that they, that or, they use. Or, you know, you had, like, two great-great-great-granddaddies who are in entirely different branches of his uh, family tree who divorced whomever they were married were or they never actually were, got married to the, right. the person they had a kid with and then ended up together. Or it's a giant polycule. <laughs> well... <laughs> A word that I absolutely love ever since I learned that in the sort of polyamorous community. Some people who choose to use the term like polycule and and, and whatever for their various relationships, they can sort of indicate like the different relationship that members of such a polycule have. And like these are just, you know, fraternal or or they're friends and these are sexually involved or romantically involved and use different like lines to indicate the covalent bonds. It's just like a molecule. Yeah. All right. I wasn't aware that this exists, but it... 
Isn't it seems, cool? Yeah, seems logical. I absolutely love it. Uh, so, yes, his romantically involved gay great-great-granddaddies who ran a and b in Vermont also apparently produced a like weed a phosphate. spray. <laughs> Yikes, is that a bad one? That's basically what Roundup's made out of. I had Roundup written down as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uhura comes back with her research saying like... Stavos Connecticleus, Earth Scientist, period... Eugenics wars, planned clone, perfect specimen prototype into master race. Wow, we've never heard that one before. Everyone's heard about it. Like Spock says, there used to be a story about a modern diodic. There used to be a story. What does that mean? Who told you this story? I know. Yeah. Okay, but whatever. But it's interesting how they're sort of integrating a whole lot of different information in this scene. You know, a lot that they've learned from Caniclius. He said he was number five. Yes, that's right? something that Kirk mentioned. It's like, oh, maybe he's been cloning himself. And I'm, I'm here sitting there going, like, okay, so maybe every clone gets a little bigger or something? Because... <laughs> Hey, but cloning Imperfect was... cloning, which seems a bit weird if you're, like, trying to work off a perfect specimen. You'd figure you'd, you'd get your cloning down to a T first rather than... But, you know. Ah, yeah, but we find out that he can clone the body but not the mind. Which right, is... yes. And, like, this is 1973. You know, Walter Keenig had picked up the concept of cloning from a newspaper article. Oh. It wasn't a widely known concept. It was a, a theoretical scientific endeavor that was just entering public uh, popular consciousness. Mm. Kirk decides on a ruse. Scotty, as soon as we beam down, I want you to leave orbit. If they think we've gone, they won't be scanning the surface. Give us 30 minutes. This is like, how many warp cores do you I'm have sorry, exactly? I'm sorry, there's a lot. There's a lot. Sorry, sorry. Hey, I'm, no, okay, I, I'm having, to... I, am, I, I will admit I am having difficulty being joyful about this episode. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe we should talk about this a little bit. Imagine that you're in 1973, right? Your favorite TV show has yeah. been cancelled for several years. Well... Actually, this story isn't going to lead where I thought it was because there was a huge, huge campaign among Star Trek fans to prevent the airing of the animated series. They didn't oh. want yeah, the legacy of their favorite show tarnished mm. with something so cheap and tawdry as a toy-selling advertisement. Oh, yeah, I can see that. I mean, that's a probably a very true argument. There's some well, very peculiar sounds coming out of my camera. Oh, your Tribble. Yes, your, your yeah, extremely she's... aggressive Viper Tribble. <laughs> she is like... Little Pit. She, she's definitely <laughs> trilling now. Like, <laughs> I was shining my watch on the ceiling purely accidentally, producing a little spot of light there, and she was doing the whole like <laughs> thing. <laughs> She was definitely, I don't know why, how cats come to think that that attracts birds or hides them from birds or whatever. Uh, for the record, our uh, our companion today is Kay's Kitty, a podcast of a mere, like, 10, 11 weeks old. Something like that, yeah. At we, this point. We don't, we don't know exactly, because she uh, just showed up in our uh, next door neighbor's garden. Pip is wonderfully adventurous, but she's also a little terror, so while we're recording, she has to be in kitty jail. Because otherwise she, she chews on our cables. And she is singing the song of her people. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> so Bones, Sulu, and Kirk beam down without their weapons, because they're not going to work, and investigate some of these other buildings. And they find one filled with these overgrown spaceships, advanced spaceships, such a gigantic fleet. Yes, with the aliens pulling the uh, weeds off them. And, and they seem to be preparing it for an uh, invasion or an excavation, I guess. Ooh, interesting terminology. Also, those, the placement of those ships is kind of peculiar, but never mind. What? In gonna, a hangar? Well, you're not going to launch them from that position, so... No, you yeah. can store them. Yeah, fair. Because we learn, hey, we, we learned this, that this this species wanted to do what Caniclius also wanted to do, which is yes. presumably why he sought them out. They wanted to impose their own version of peace on a chaotic universe. And his arrival terribly like prevented that from happening by... Killing them all by, yeah. by accident. By accident, yeah. So here comes my... Okay, I've got one more point of criticism. Oh, it's my like God. At, at this point, there's like a few times, like what Kirk says, like... The Philosians built a technology possibly greater than anything we animal species did. It, it follows with a whole bunch of... Oh, so much speculation. Uh, platitudes and... I mean, he's got his boots of conclusion jumping on. It's like... <laughs> he's just like... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, no, I lied. There's one more. Oh, my God. Like, every <laughs> shuttle has dumped its little warp core as I well. Know. You're, just, you're just, just devoid of warp cores anymore. I am out of spoot. No warp cores. <laughs> <It's> like, 
And Kirk has one more conclusion, which is he's seized upon the psychology of these Philosians, that they're feverish followers. Yes. Well, followers can be led. Yes, exactly. And we're going to do that by grabbing this plant guy in a chokehold. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but again... Kirk says, I mean, even though he you should have threatened him with a nice little hollandaise sauce or something, that would be much more effective against an artichoke guy. But Kirk isn't doing that. No. He says, we don't want to hurt you, but we must have Spock back. And Agmar says, no, that's not possible. The Vulcan human blend of wisdom, sense of order, durability and strength is the finest the master has ever found. Yes, and they're happy that Spock is going to be able to continue their mission because they are a dying race, we learn. All their spores have died out, and these are the last Philistocians that will be here, and no more Philistines will come from this planet to go oh, into the galaxy. Oh, you're being so... This is really sad. Can you feel how, how, how sad this is? Uh, I have a hard time feeling sad for... Listen, imagine yeah. you're a Philotian. Yes. Right? You're... For all we know, these are the last four living members of their of their it seems, species. Seems, seems seems plausible, considering the fact that none of the scans showed up any. So yes, right. Yeah. Well, they also chose not to reveal themselves. But no. whatever, whatever number it is, those are the last living ones, and everyone knows that if they're very lucky, they will see either all of their friends die or none of their friends die before they themselves die, and there will be no more of them. And they're like providing this fleet. So that someone can continue their mission, which is similar to the mission that they themselves had. Like, I can really feel for their obsession and their, and their militarism, because it's all they've got to, to hang on to. Mm. It's the only continuation of Philotian culture that they have available to them. Well, there's a peculiar thing about that when it's Bones who asks, What if something happens to Spock or the Master? There will always be a Master. Something that's completely glossed over. Well, yeah, they're, they're completely, like, obsessed, right? The, the master is never wrong. The master right. always knows. Oh, maybe they're just referring to the fact that he's just going to clone himself and they're like, if something does happen to him, then the next clone is going to come around? I don't know. I mean, yeah. maybe they themselves are, like, deficient clones. They're, they're significantly smaller. Yeah, why is he he's not cloning like them? Oh, maybe it's not possible. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm. Agmar says he was alive when his ancestors were dying. But out. only barely, yeah. He was very young. But why can't he clone them? I mean, cloning plants is usually a little heck of a lot easier than cloning animals. They're very advanced life forms. Yeah. The, the technology that he brought with him from Earth might not be able to do it. Yeah, we see a little bit of... He brings out the remote with one button that does everything. Yeah, but he manipulates it with tentacles. Yeah. Kind of like, he's probably got some cool cording. And continuing with the theme of creating imagery that is... Relatively easy in animation and very difficult in live action. Like this, this mechanism swoops down yeah, yes. to these tunnels. Which Floating we, platform. Which we learn is where the, the Philotians evolved. Like they come from underground. That's where their culture started. So these yeah. tunnels are part of their civilizational structures. Surprise attack by more floaters. Flyers. Quick, says Sulu. Use the belt lights. And it stays dark. Uh, yeah, because they're not working. What are belt lights? Mm. Why Why is your belt where you want lights to... Or maybe it's just like flashlights that you ha have on have your on belt. On your belt, yeah. Mm. I mean, I've seen like East German uh, road police, which uh -huh. had like... like the, they had those like bandolier type belts, which literally had like orange glowy lights on them. Oh, cool. Just to, to make them more visible. Okay, but what I want to imagine here is basically like a belt buckle with a high beam. Oh, right. So, so you kind of have to jut your crotch forward in the direction that you want your light to point. Yes. Yeah, I figured yeah, it was going to yeah. be something like that. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm thinking about here. They run to the end of the corridor where they find uh, Spock lying in a Sleeping Beauty-like cage. Yes, and McCoy bends over and says, oh, something's happening. He's Something, dying again. Something's happened to his, Greg, brain. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Caniclius says, yeah, whatever, that just happens. Because the only way to transfer a mind from a host body into a, into a clone is essentially by destroying the original. And well, that's what his predecessors yes. did for him, right? He's yeah. Caniclius V, Caniclius V, one did it for Caniclius II, etc., etc. And he introduces Spock II, who is a giant... Spock. 50-foot Spock, just as promised. He's, he's enormous. Yep. More random attacks by the, the flyers... Yes, because the swoopers. Yeah, because Caniclius, no, scree, scree. Caniclius himself certainly kick, couldn't kick the shit out of them with uh, <laughs> that staff of his, you know. He just never stands out. I don't think we ever see Caniclius in another pose than standing there with his staff. Yeah, just... Yeah. 
just tits forward. Out comes the roundup, which works great on the floaters, flyers. God, the swoopers. Fortunately, the Philistines have f***ed off for while the roundup was being sprayed around because they're not affected. Well, how about that? Great granddaddy's weed spray still works. Yeah. Mm. Everybody's wearing cool face masks, by the way, yes. before they deploy their... Uh, Very COVID. Now the plan comes to fruition, because the Enterprise should be back by now, so we should be able to communicate once again. But, oh, no! Must be these blasted walls again. Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, they're dealing with the same problem. We yes, have to... they've noticed that they, they cannot communicate them, and they carefully deduce that they need to put out more power. At the risk of, of permanently depleting or destroying their dilithium crystals. Yes, which is something that Uhura needs to point out to... Scotty, which Scotty actually probably knows, but he's just like, yeah, you know, like I've kind of always been underreporting the uh, capacity of these things, and I, and I know can, they, they can handle at least thirty-five percent more than what I've always said they could, just in case I needed to pull a little bit more power output out of them when the ca captain is unreasonably oh demanding for them. She kind of take it, he says, while the levels are hovering comfortably in the green. Yeah, like inch, inching towards the yellow, you know, it's like. Yeah. I like this, though, because Uhura is the acting first officer, essentially. Right, yes. You know, she's, she's providing a critical voice, even in public, no, yeah. for, for the captain to respond to, the captain in charge. And uh, which, like, in this yeah. case, is Scotty. But he insists that... But we must speak to the captain. Keep pouring out more power into them so we can get a message across. McCoy, meanwhile, reminds us of how much time is remaining, mere minutes, and he's slipping away, Spock's slipping away... And Kirk decides on a really interesting strategy. Instead of trying to convince Caniclius, or, or, or Caniculus, as he calls him, yeah. Kirk throws his communicator up at Giant Spock, and he challenges Giant Spock. What is the logic in letting a man die for the sake of creating his duplicate? Explain it to me, sir. Explain it to me. And the, the goal he has is to show Caniclius your Giant Spock army is not going to serve you and take over the universe. Because they don't like, agree with your basic uh, premise. Yeah. He even pulls out the idic, which is, I do believe, it's a symbol. Oh, Chief, please stand by to correct me on this. As I remember, the idic is a symbol that has been featured in Star Trek because Gene Roddenberry wanted to do more merchandising. Oh, yes. But I think now this episode is where it's, where it's explained. Infinite diversity in infinite combinations, symbolizing the elements that create truth and beauty. A piece of beautiful, like... Vulcan philosophy that's never really specified. Yeah. Although I do like that Vulcans appreciate, like, truth and beauty as equal. But his argument is, what is the value of destroying Spock's life in order to just create a duplicate? It's a meaningless death. Yeah. Well, except he's going to be huge and awesome. He's going to be a peacekeeper force, like enforcing peace on the galaxy, because we all know that enforcing peace always is the best way to uh, uh -huh. ensure peace. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now it's my turn to dump the secondary <laughs> yeah, warp core. There. <laughs> Can I feel very strongly about that? No, I'm not going to. I'm actually saving my warp core. It's going to come up, and it's going to okay. come up yeah. soon. Like, in a future episode, you you stand by. Because, yes, right. imposed peace is no peace at all, Star Trek. You're from Northern Ireland, aren't you? Uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> so you're from Northern Ireland. Tell? Yeah. <laughs> But yes, uh, Spock talks to Uhura, who says, like, oh, I've had the uh, computer check out uh, what uh, Caniculus has written. They are obscure, but there is a recurring theme in his later essays about using his master race as a peacekeeping force throughout the galaxy. Okay. I uh, know, I'm not. This would be considered another warp core dump. Okay, just a, okay, just a little bit of plasma. If it requires making a clone, requires destroying the original to create the mind transfer. How are you going to make an army of Spocks? Okay, you know what? That should have been your one. All the other Fair ones enough. are secondary. <laughs> no, this this one, should this have been one, it. This one only really just occurred to me right now. It's just no, like... me too. <laughs> but it's it's the one that makes complete <laughs> yeah. sense because we've just been told that you can't create a clone without destroying the mind of the original. Yeah. So how can you make populate a, an army of? Clones? Clones. Yeah, it's not really going to work. All those ships yeah. with, and also it would be a navy of clones, Fair. Fair. Yeah. right? <laughs> so yes, navy. that doesn't make a lot of sense. But what's really cool here is that this information is what unlocks the solution. Kirk yeah. now understands Caniclius's motivations. What he wants. What he yeah. 
And like from the concerning that he's from the time of the eugenics wars, which I think is something that's come up. Yes, that's where uh, Khan is from. Khan right. Union yes, and of course the uh, distant future of the 1990s and, and the first officer of uh, Strange New World. Strange New World. Very like good. She's, uh, La An Union. Yes, Singh. she's a product. Of, well, her her lineage is a product of that. Uh, I think she's like just a descendant. Yeah. Of Khan. Kirk is now able to confront Caniclius with, you're operating from a false premise. We already have peace in the Federation. It wasn't imposed. It was agreed upon. This is the Federation's goal, except we do it through peace talks and negotiations and not through 50-foot-tall peace enforcers. <laughs> <laughs> Which genuinely is a, a beautiful like story element. Like, mm. we've oh, already yeah, figured absolutely. out how to do this. It's much harder, and it's less effective, but it's a much better way of doing it. And by taking away the conflict between them, right, because I, I think this message is that the, neither the Philotians nor Caniclius himself are essentially evil, but they weren't able to see a solution for the problems that the, the galaxy faced that didn't involve, you know, taking away their will and, like, imposing peace and imposing these solutions as a... A very corrupt form of philanthropy. Yeah. And uh, the Philotians actually seem to agree when they when they hear about the uh, Federation. They're like, well, yes, we were going to launch a fleet of ships to to spread peace around the galaxy. Sounds like you already did that. Yeah, but it's like, Kinda. oh, like, yeah. I mean, it's 200 years later. They've been out of touch with local news for 200 years. So they yeah, don't, wouldn't yeah. have known that the Federation has sprung up. Uh, Spock, meanwhile, has passed over the Rainbow Bridge and Kirk is enraged. But Spock, too, has a solution. And in an image that I uh, must have spawned a lot of other fan fictions <laughs> on password-protected tumblers, <laughs> pushes his giant forefingers onto little Spock's forehead and Sulu goes, oh, The Vulcan mind touch. My mind to your mind. And Hadn't that done before? I mean, that was, was that from a series thing or was that only introduced... No, Here. in the original series, you could just do whatever and call it the Vulcan whatever. Fair, yeah. And just say that people yeah. knew about it. No, no, I get that. I was just wondering if this is where the, the mind meld or the mind touch was introduced. Like if, oh. if it's already been used in the original series or if it's like... Interesting. Greg, Chief, can you look at... Yeah, yeah just, can you look that up for us? Uhura, thank you. <laughs> I object to you referring to me as Uhura just in the very premise that I will never be as accomplished and wonderful as Nichelle Nichols was. That aside, no, this is not the first appearance of the Vulcan Mind Meld. The first appearance of the Vulcan Mind Meld was in season one, episode 10 of the original series, Dagger of the Mind, in which Spock decides to employ an ancient technique, the Vulcan Mind Meld, to learn the truth that a man named uh, Dr. Simon Van Gelder cannot speak aloud. And it's the first time that Spock had ever performed a mind meld on a human. So. It had been around quite a few times in the original series as well. So by this time, it was already very well established. Oh, no. We're, he's, he's stuck behind walls that are 600 times denser than lead. We can't hear him yet. We'll hear it on the recording. Right. And Spock comes back to life. And, oh, wow. Now, oh, let's he, play some romantic music because everyone's got some really nice compliments for their very oh, good friends. <laughs> uh-huh. There appears to be no end to your arsenal of formidable talents, says Spock to Kirk. And Kirk goes, oh, Spock, you old yeah. muscle slut or whatever he's about to say. Well, the first one is like, when you are not being bellicose, there appears to be no end to your arsenal of formidable talents. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we've just proven it wrong that like you cannot create a clone without destroying the original because oh, if it's yeah. a Vulcan, then like, oh, now you have a clone. And like, then they do a mind melt and then they're both fine. This is interesting. He wouldn't have known about Vulcans. He wouldn't? Well, you did call him up. So the Felotians seem to know oh, that right, he was a yes. Vulcan-human hybrid, which uh, where they got that information, I don't know. Yeah. But Caniclius left Earth before first contact with the Vulcans. Yes, but his was, ooh, yeah, but he's not... Been gone missing for, yeah, good. We'd have to get the timeline on that. It's timey wimey. It's yes. okay. Strange New Worlds has, has introduced some interesting plot elements to sort of explain that away. You know, yeah. there's a, an interaction at some point with uh, a member of the uh, Temporal like Investigations Committee from the future. Which but uh, Spock 2 goes this like there. No, I'm still talking about oh, that. I'm still sort of correcting this where they, they drop the line. Well, you know, when I was going to the academy, the eugenics wars were still happen still had still happened in the 1990s, but my, now they've moved 
move deeper into the 21st century. <laughs> Fair, yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Please go no, ahead. That's right. And you needn't worry, Captain Kirk, about a master race. There will be no militia. No other Spocks. Getting a bit of a whine from Caligula. It's like, but what about my work? What about my achievements? <laughs> what am I going to do? I, all I have left for is already done. Like, now what I'm like, oh no, our peace has already been brought to the galaxy while I was working on bringing peace to the galaxy. Well, Kirk has an idea and he puts someone to work. It's like when you've got a, a, a whiny kid, you give them something to do. And he says, why don't you try and save these people that you through your ignorance, yes. eradicated because you introduced the, the Staphylococcus infectious strain, which is that a bacteria or a virus? It is, but... Let's um, not worry about that too much. Staphylococcus. I'm, I'm, wanting, wanting, I'm wanting to say that it's the poo bacteria, but that's... Staph infection. No. I mean, they're they're oh right, no, they're no, popular the, in hospitals. Yeah. Popular. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, ooh, not sure. Staph. No, you're right. It's a different one. I'm thinking. Well, never mind. Giant Spock remains behind with Giant Caniculus Five. Spock Two and Caniculus Five. Who? Wow, those sound like boy bands. Spock Two and Caniculus Five. Yes. And yeah. The, and the Caniculus Five. Then it would Spock definitely. Spock Two and the Caniculus, Caniculus Five. five. <laughs> That's a doo-wop band. That's a K <laughs> a K-pop doo-wop band. <laughs> <laughs> Try and figure that out. <sighs> and we have to end on a stupid joke. And the stupid joke is Kirk going up to Sulu in the middle of a mission and says, Hey, any chance of teaching me that body throw could come in handy sometime. Now, I've used lines like that on people that I wanted yeah. to, you know. <laughs> it could come in handy sometimes. Cool private activities with that we were probably both really interested in, but uh, Sulu gives him a soft no. I don't know, sir. It isn't just physical, you know. You have to be uh, inscrutable. And then Kirk says, Sulu, you're the most scrutable man I know. And Sulu f***ing winks. And I was like, what, what the f*** is this? What is this? Is this like a college thing? Like, oh, are we going to go a little bit, doing a little bit of scruting after class? It's yeah. Oh, wow. He scruted me five times. <laughs> <laughs> How many Starfleet officers does it take to scrut in a light bulb? Depends. <laughs> is there a holodeck or not? Oh, Oh, okay, dear. so yeah. I think we found out how we, if when we do another episode of, of the animated series, yes. how about next time we get f***ing high? Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Right? We just get, like, seriously felosioned up. <laughs> <laughs> and then watch it. And, like, it might be real, like, deep and insightful, like a Led Zeppelin album. Do you know... Not to bring us back down again, no. but Walter Koenig was really unhappy because this was not a very well-received episode. And a lot uh -huh. of people like you thought it was silly and dumped all their warp cores over it. Yeah. And he went through through life. Like, he, he chose not to do another episode. Yeah. And in interviews, you can hear that he's really quite sad about it because this was his, you know, an important credit of his. And then he learned, decades later, in a book about the animated series, that Dorothy Fontana known as DC Fontana, because, yeah. you know, women in, in sci-fi often had to go by their initials to appear yeah, like that. Like yeah. She was the showrunner for the animated series, but, like, as a woman, she was sort of kept out of the loop. Like, imagine being a showrunner who didn't get to see final edits of episodes unless oh, she specifically asked yeah. for it. But she said, she'd already died by this time, that this was her favorite episode oh. of the entire animated series. Wow. She thought it was big, big swings, right? We like those. Yeah. It was smart. It had a very important message. There was a lot of it that was really original. And, and, and we got some great like character interactions. She thought that this was everything that was great about the animated series. And that was real Star Trek. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of heartening. To know that a woman of Dorothy Fontana's legendary skills and insights loved this show because I do too. Oh. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good Just moving on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really don't know what to say about that. Like, I will, I wholeheartedly support you in your opinion on this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, your face just says, oh, how nice for you. <laughs> well, just let me see if I have any, uh, if I have yeah, any notes. Yeah, come that on. I mean, like, bring it around. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, I do have to say, like, I love the high heels on Spock, too. Does he have high heels? Well, it's not high heels, but they're bloody well high platform shoes. There's like, there's a big heel gap under his shoes. Oh, whoa. Another thousand fanfics were spawned on a very different... Like, where, there's, there's whereabouts a, there's is that? There's a few shots where you're going like, oh, there's a big heel gap there. Um, Ooh. 
Oh, I didn't get to see those on my static GIFs. Oh, put them okay. in the in the animated GIFs. I it, yes, I, I just noticed them a few times. Like I, I'm, I've got a hard time like finding a correct shot here of them here. Damn, that's a big heel on a comfortable hey, shoe. Hey, some or... of these are for like foot people, and some people are into pecs, and like some people are for like very small heads, foreshortened, very large heads, foreshortened, like oh, yeah. whatever you're into. Oh no, the animation this team did, got it, it all. Did, a, did a great job on that. On, uh, on that, artichoke headed people. Angry Uhura, complacent Scotty. This episode has got it all. And like winking Sulu, booty tooching Sulu. There's really nothing <laughs> you can ask re- for. They were really working on his saucy uh, image at that I point, isn't, wasn't he? Oh, he's a real sex bot. Yeah. It's so great. for segments, I don't have a song for us to sing. I don't have a karaoke, which I'm okay. honestly not sure would have been a sustainable segment anyway. So maybe fair, that's a sometimes fair, fair food. Fair point, yes. I do have two books. All right. I have the, the Klingon Dictionary, so oh, yeah. we can get another yes. word of the day. Are you interested mm-hmm. in that, or sure. are you interested in the mystery book? Okay, though. Well, no, I'm not going to always no, tell. I always fine, pick the mystery fine. book. Got, oh, you want the mystery book? Okay, I always this pick is exciting. The, I always pick the unknown over the known when it comes to this kind of thing. <laughs> That's the right attitude. Welcome to the Joy of Trek, everyone, where we dive into the unknown rather than the, the safe. Because I have for you... The Actual Joy Joy of of Trek. Oh, wow. (laughs) There was actually a book by this name. The Joy of Trek, How to Enhance Your Relationship with a Star Trek Fan. Yes. This book has not been authorized uh, by an entity involved with the creation of a production of Star Trek. A complete introduction (laughs) to the Star Trek universe by Sam Raymer. Isn't this amazing? (laughs) Yeah. It's out of print. I got a secondhand copy. I honestly didn't know that this existed when we started pre-production on our show. Like, much, much later, I actually decided to Google this term. I'd apparently Googled it in combination with, like, podcast or Star Trek or whatever. Right. And this book didn't come up. I finally was able to track down a copy. So how about you have a little riffle through All and right. see if you can find, like, an interesting so bit. So it was produced in 1997. So oh, wow, that's, that's just, pretty recent. Well, just, a recent just about mm-hmm. involves DS9, I guess. And that's, you know, just to put it in. Oh, with, uh, 97 Voyager would have actually come out already. Oh, okay. I wouldn't it have finished have, yet. Yeah. Generations, yes. Oh, First Contact as well. Those films would have already been out. You've got a lead time for about two years in writing a book, you know? So if it was, like, brought out in 97, then oh, there's like a good so. chance that the lot, latest bit of, like, canon, which is, like, included in the book, was 95, because that's about the time that the they would have, like, expected to hand in their... Uh, the manuscript, manuscript. yeah. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. All right, let's have a quick, a quick look. We are page 111. Dr. Julian Bashir, played by Alexander Siddick. In a nutshell, Dr. Bashir is a chief medical officer on Deep Space Nine, a handsome young man. It's like some of the doctors on the ER, except he's a doctor because he had his intelligence genetically enhanced as a youngster. Spoilers! Oh, sorry. No, it's I mean, like spoilers. It, it, book. Right, it's, well, it's 25 from, years. From 97, 97. Right. Like the doctors on ER, he fools around with anybody he can. He saves people and performs some spontaneous acts of kindness. He's friends with the mysterious Cardassian Taylor Garrick. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I'm sure... Very good friends. I'm sure Garrick would consider them to be. Like, if Bashir thinks of it like, <laughs> in the same way, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that one. And he loves to play on the holodeck. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ooh, wow. Yeah. I wonder if he does size play fantasies. Well, on the holodeck, I suppose it would be very easy to do. Uh-huh. Computer, Philo's Fantasy 15. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Missing scene. Oh, cutting room yes. floor scene. Cutting room floor. So what do you think was left on the cutting room floor? Well, the, on the cutting room floor was left the scene after they beam back for the first time and uh, Bones has brought back a uh, clipping from one of the old big aliens that they found in the house. <gasps> and they're sitting there in the captain's uh, quarters blazing it, uh, <laughs> trying to philosophize about how to deal with it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, my deleted scene... Oh, man, this is really a peaceful mind. Like, it really gives you this really high, loving high, which makes you, like, want to be friends with everybody else. Oh, no. Because I even found a quote from... Hey, this is an unusual source for for Star Trek. I found a quote as I was looking for uh, reviews of The Infinite Vulcan. George Takei, by the way, says Um, uh, he appreciated Keenig sharing with us another of his many talents... This one is from Dr. David Galbraith. Galbraith, I probably should pronounce it, head of science at the Royal Botanican Garden. Oh. Yeah. Who says that? While plants feature in many Star Trek stories, the Phylosians are the only ones in that universe that appear to become sentient. We may never know if in some alternate Star Trek universe, the Phylosians are now, and this is with PH, 
flourishing. <laughs> I like it, yes. Well, oh. see, in my alternative deleted scene, instead of the Federation discovering that these wonderful plant people are fantastic, if you just chop them up, grind them into powder, yeah. roll them into a spleef or a duber or however you choose to uh, enjoy your, your uh, herbal... Yeah, that's recreation, yes. Basically, Baby Groot is what I'm thinking of. Oh. That it's just... His great grand McCoy's great granddaddies taught him how to uh, how to grow this plant take a little... cloning. Literally, it is called cloning. Cloning, isn't it? yes. This this purely hypothetical thing because enting enting is when you stick uh, one plant on top of another one and like have it grow. Like take a branch from one kind of tree and stick it onto another tree and have them oh. grow together. But cloning is literally yeah. You take a clipping and you create the right conditions for that little clipping to start producing new roots. Yep, I'm thinking like Felosian baby Groot. Cloning. Yeah, who yeah. gets like really into I mean, that's how br- Smash yeah, Mouth. That's literally how baby Groot is made. It's like, you know, they find a little bit yes. of uh, old Groot and plant him. and he Marvel grows, Cinematic Universe. Grows into a new, cl- nose into a new Groot. Okay. Oh, actually, I like right. yours well, better. I like oh. yours better. Like, it's so grim that they're grinding up these old corpses and smoking them. But hey, like, you know, the circle of life, the carbon cycle finds a place. I'm going to shut up before I talk myself into a genocide. All right. So I'm leaving Starfleet. For- Energize. <laughs> we hope you've enjoyed this week's episode with friends K and Kaki. Production and editing by Chief Engineer Greg and music by Fox Amor. Join us next time for Deep Space Nine Season 3, Episode 22, Explorers. You can visit joyoftrek.com slash links to send us your recommendations, support us on Patreon, or find us on Blue Sky, Instagram, and Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening to The Joy of Trek, and we'll see you out there.